Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed, part two of the May Q and A. If you missed part one, links in the very description. What, do you, what did you think about the uh, part one? I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, a lot of fun. I mean, I don't think I've ever said we've done a bad Q and A, so maybe I'm not as critical of myself as I should be, but. I'm going to stick with that we've done a good job on every single one. So I like that. More questions coming up in this part two. Definitely stay tuned. And before we get to the questions. Today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a two gram syringe. This high performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. All right, Tim, I think this is actually a Tim one. What are your thoughts on NVIDIA's tensor cores in DLSS? And now that FSR 2.0 seemingly provides similar image reconstruction and performance gains without the need for specialized cores. They are both using different techniques. However, it makes the tensor cores in DLSS look pointless in the same slash very similar fidelity uh, can be achieved in FSR 2.0 without them. So this is a mm. this is going to be a <laughs> bit of a, a hot button topic this oh, one going forward. Probably. I, I mean, I think this question may be minimizes the gap between DLSS and FSR 2.0. They are very close, but DLSS, in my opinion, is still better. So if you're sort of looking at image quality and you're sort of thinking, well, you know, it makes the tensor cores look pointless, they still do have the superior technology in some circumstances. A lot mm -hmm. of circumstances are very close, but in some sort of edge cases where you're really looking at like, taking 1080p up to 4K, I think DLSS has the edge there. So when you sort of think about that and you're like, well, they did it on tensor cores, but they are doing it better, you kind of in some ways can't criticize them too much. I think if FSR was better and also not using tensor cores, then the tensor core approach would look pretty silly, but I don't think we're quite there yet. However, you know, I guess AMD's approach has a lot of strengths that is hopefully going to see it adopted in a wide number of games and support on a wide number of hardware. I certainly think that going with a wide approach makes more sense for these technologies. You kind of do want to support them across a, a wide variety of hardware. So from that sense, you know, I guess it's a, a positive achievement for AMD. They've certainly done it. It's impressive, in my opinion, that they've been able to do it without specialized hardware. But then again, you know, another sort of con is that they took ages to do it. Mm -hmm. So NVIDIA had DLSS 2.0 ready sort of start of 2020, FSR 2.0 sort of early to mid 2022. So it's quite a gap there as well. So yeah, I guess moving forward, it sort of does reduce the need for tensor cores if image reconstruction like it can be done without them. But if NVIDIA can keep having the edge in terms of image quality and maybe they can improve performance, who knows, then I guess they can still continue to justify their method and using tensor cores in that way. So yeah, we'll just have to see how these technologies progress and yeah, which one, yeah, maybe we sit here in a couple of years and FSR 2.0 is is better in all areas, but we just can't say that just yet. Yeah, I guess it's, maybe they're angling from the point of it's got specialized hardware, which takes up silicon real estate. Yeah. And it's been this big thing and AMD has got very close without requiring any special hardware. So at what point does it become a bit pointless having specialized hardware if it's only that much better? Which I'm not saying is the case now, but if they if FSR also continues to get better and they get to the point where it doesn't really matter which one you use, um, I think at that point that would be where DLSS effectively dies. And I'm not suggesting that's going to happen. Um, a lot of that comes down to game support and yeah, how close they end up getting. But yeah, it's an interesting one. If, they've, if they require specialized hardware to get a small improvement. Mm. And I mean, th th this is all the sort of thing about, and we've talked about this on the channel before, about how, I guess in our opinion, the tensor cores came first. Yeah. So like the chicken and egg it's, sort of yeah. thing. I don't think DLSS was designed and then they're like, oh, we now need to put tensor cores in the <laughs> GPU. It's, the GPU was designed with tensor cores because they wanted a very similar architecture that they could use for their consumer GPUs and their server GPUs. Mm -hmm. And obviously the AI acceleration stuff helps significantly for things like data center and even for some, you know, professional workloads, not mm -hmm. gaming, but, you know, your sort of 
Yeah, they you, were trying to make it useful. They were trying to make it appeal to gamers. Yeah, so they, so they could. They're like, yeah. well, how do we sell tensor cores to gamers? We're going to mm-hmm. need some feature that uses this. So then DLSS was one of the technologies that mm-hmm. they debuted. The first version was terrible. They had to completely redo it for version 2.0, and now we're currently where we're at. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I sort of see a similar parallel to G-Sync, where G-Sync also required dedicated mm-hmm. specialized hardware. And then eventually, you know, AMD, Vaser, they came out with their more open approach that worked on a much wider range of scalers, was much cheaper to implement, Mm -hmm. and then you saw less and less need for G-Sync hardware. There are still some monitors that use G-Sync because there are a few small advantages, but generally speaking, most monitors support the more wider technology. So... I think you can sort of look at this situation with these upscalers and look at G-Sync and you sort of see two things. So I agree. I think if if it gets to the point where FSR is in a lot of games, mm-hmm. it gets very close, closer than it is today to DLSS, then the whole using specialized hardware thing just becomes more and more of a negative yep. for using DLSS. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we'll see how that one plays out, I guess. All right, Tim, question here that you might find interesting since you covered the Zen 4 news. <laughs> Uh, do you think AMD withheld slash downplayed slash hid? I did, got them around the wrong way, but you know. Uh, additional information about Zen 4 in their recent keynote regarding performance and pricing and will drop a surprise bomb closer to launch. So in short, are AMD sandbagging? I think that's the easiest way to ask that question. Okay. Or were they sandbagging? So when it comes to things like sandbagging, you have to think, what is the benefit that AMD would gain from doing this? Mm-hmm. And I've seen a lot of people saying they're, sa- they're sandbagging. They're definitely sandbagging. But <laughs> it comes a lot. It comes without the sort of thinking of why they would do that. Sure. And, you know, the main reason why a company would do something like this is to affect their competitor. They want Intel to think their, perform- their hardware is worse. So then Intel makes some moves that benefit AMD, right? So it's kind of like playing a game of of chess. (laughs) You're kind of trying to preempt what they're going to do so that you can make a better counter move later. That works on the assumption that Intel doesn't know everything. Yeah, so that's right. There's kind of a couple of ways where this kind of falls apart. One is that companies tend to have a fairly good idea of what their competitors are doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, better information than leaks that we see is pretty typical for companies. Mm -hmm. Second to that is... Intel can't really change much about their product at this point. They certainly can't change the hardware for Raptor Lake, which mm-hmm. will be competing against Zen 4, because these architectures are locked in months, years in advance. And at this point, you'd expect that they're even being manufactured, like mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. So it's too late for Intel to come out and be like, oh, well, we need to add more cores or increase the frequency. They can't do that. Mm-hmm. It's just not possible. Then things like pricing... This is kind of the main argument that I think people make is that people think AMD is going to make their product look worse so Intel maybe prices their components too high, which then means that Intel AMD can come out and undercut them or whatever and look really good. We're expecting AMD to go first, right? Yeah. So but with <laughs> things like pricing, it, it all the conditions are always set by who launches first. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really matter what they say in the lead up. If Intel can come out with whatever pricing they want to, Mm -hmm. and then it's up to AMD to respond to that. If AMD goes first, it's up to Intel to respond to that. So doing things like sandbagging, I don't think makes too much of an impact to things like that. They kind of have to compete in the market one way or another. And if Intel prices their parts too high and AMD undercuts them, it's on Intel to make their parts cheaper. And if the reverse happens, because Intel goes first, then, you know, or AMD goes first, then... It just has to happen the other way around. So I think with these discussions of, of things like sandbagging, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if you see the reaction from people to the performance numbers that were shown, mm-hmm. things in particular the single thread performance uplift number mm-hmm. of I think they said greater than 15%, mm-hmm. a lot of people were like, oh, that that's not very good. Like I was I was hyped for this part. I was expecting big performance gains. You know, I was reading the leaks and seeing 25 to 30% being talked about. Now AMD is talking about 15%. Well, I'm, I'm not going to pay attention anymore. Mm-hmm. So I think the the negatives of doing it that way, you know, the, the hurt that you get from kind of destroying your marketing a little bit significantly offsets any gains they would have by playing this sort of 3D, 4D <laughs> chess with Intel in terms of making them 
seem like their their parts are worse. Yeah. I just don't think there's a significant benefit to doing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I guess with these discussions as well, AMD's been pretty accurate in the past with performance claims. Yeah, if anything, I would say for the most part, they show their product in the best light possible. And AMD yes. does that to a lesser degree than their competitors for the most part. They are fairly accurate. But yes. it is, again, mark expected marketing BS to a degree. Like it is best case scenario almost always. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there have been a few minor instances where they've come out with one figure. Reviewers have come out with a slightly better figure. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking significant differences. No. We're not talking taking a 15% gain and doubling that to a 30% gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if anything, that's been more just the final product has turned out to be slightly better than AMD said at the time. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like a very early performance claim. Then, you know, the product comes out six months later and it turns out that it's like slightly better than yep. what they said. They could get slightly better yields, slightly better frequency or whatever. But, they're, you know, I think the multi-thread performance claims they've made have been reasonably solid. So I don't think there's any reason to think that, you know, they w would come out and, you know, yes, they got the math slightly wrong with their performance, but... I don't think there's any reason they'd come out and say our part is significantly faster than the 12900K, but then under-represent their single-thread performance uplift. It just yeah, would like, be very bizarre. Yeah, we, have, we really have no idea how they perform. Like We have n absolutely no idea about gaming performance. Yeah, they didn't give any so, hint to that at all. Yeah, we don't know what the doubling of the L2 cache does for gaming. I, I expect that it'd be positive. Yeah. But we just don't know. We have no idea. We, it's almost not worth talking about. We know so little. Yeah. And I th Based on the official information. It's just... I think it's very interesting, I guess, that sort of the, the response to the performance claims being disappointing is that AMD is lying to you as a, or at least misleading customers on purpose as mm -hmm. opposed to that that's just the reality. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes what they're saying is just the reality. Like the reality is maybe it wasn't as good as you're yeah, expecting I, it to be. It's a bit odd though. Like I don't know. I mean, it's AMD. How many times have we criticized AMD for their odd marketing and, and events yeah. and whatnot? But it's odd that they would highlight the single thread performance if it's not that impressive. Like surely there's some more impressive aspects of Zen 4 to talk about. And then they've shown really impressive multi-threading performance but even then they mess that up by you know talking <laughs> about the render time opposed to being faster if they had a set it's 46 percent faster which i think was the figure then that's huge that's pretty impressive compared to you know current generation out of late part so a bit weird it is a bit I, weird. I guess i well again once we actually finally get it we review it and we see what it's all about we'll know just how weird it was or wasn't i suppose so that yeah. may be something to look interesting to look back on. And who knows? Maybe you know. Maybe in their internal testing, they've found that on average, Old Lake is fifteen percent faster in single thread workloads. So then they say, "Well, ours is greater than fifteen percent." So mm -hmm. it makes them, you know, maybe they're thinking that's a good figure for them. I mean, it's really hard to say what what they're thinking is mm -hmm. because they also showed things like the frequency hitting five point five gigahertz. Mm -hmm. So if you're sort of wanting to mislead customers into thinking that the products are worse than they're going to be for your 3D chess reasons or whatever whatever reason. But then you're coming out and saying, well, we've increased the frequency of our part significantly. It's kind of like, well, wh why do one but not do the yeah, other? I, I, it, I, it doesn't make any sense. I think sense. the 15% single thread is was a strange thing to, to put yeah. out there. But again, maybe it, will, maybe it won't be once we test it uh, later yeah. in the year. But I, think, I think the major point of discussion out of this is that doing these 3D chess moves is not something that makes a whole lot of sense. The benefits really aren't there for AMD. Mm -hmm. um, companies, I think maybe viewers like to see these companies try and play all these weird strategy games, sort of like it's politics where they're sort of, you know, you sort of try and preempt moves and do weird things around the side to try and mm -hmm. get get your way. But I think with most of these launches, it is very, very straightforward. And So in, in, the, in the simplest of terms, although we have absolutely no idea, we would say they're not sandbagging. Yes, I, I think... Like it may end up being, a, on average, it's 5% 
uh, yeah, maybe extra. it's twenty percent instead of yeah, fifteen. That's right. That, which is like whatever. It's yeah, much five, of a muchness. Much of a muchness. It doesn't it, change their. If it turns out that on much. average the single thread performance is twenty percent greater, it's like oh, okay, they were they're pretty close. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, I'm sure there'll be instances, maybe even like Cinebench, where it is fifteen percent. So we we don't. What we're saying is we don't think the sandbagging going on, and we're certainly not expecting the number to be like thirty percent. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah. fair to say. I think yeah the. The advantages for them doing it just aren't really there. Don't mm-hmm. really doesn't really make a lot of sense. But yeah, as we sort of talked about as well, few interesting things with that presentation. There's still a lot of uh, question marks to be answered in the future. All right, Tim. I think um, probably need the gla- uh, the crystal ball for this one. Do you have the crystal ball here? No, I did not bring it for uh, this one, unfortunately. But so all our predictions will be lesser. <laughs> I think we can probably tackle this one quite quickly. To anyone with a five thousand series CPU. Uh, is it even worthwhile to upgrade to AM5 CPUs? So, well, we don't have the new AM5 CPUs, so so basically we can't give you an answer on that because we don't know how good they are. We 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 know very little at this point, despite you know AMD giving some official information. But regardless, again, it depends. So if you have maybe uh, a lower end Ryzen. 5000 series part not that there are that many that are terribly slow like i expect the ryzen 5 5600 to be good for gaming for the foreseeable but maybe you have one of the apus or something like that um then you know you maybe maybe you're also gaming but getting into video editing or something like that so you want some more cores um then you have to do a platform upgrade so (laughs) and then yeah Yeah. look i think i think for ryzen 5000 series owners you've probably got a really fast computer that's going to do what you need to do for the next few years so you'd probably skip the initial release jump on the second uh, generation of am5 where ddr5 memory will have hopefully come down to sort of meet ddr4 so my guess would be no it's not going to make sense I think it's pretty rare to see situations where it makes sense to do a single generation yeah, upgrade for almost CPUs. Never. Like unless you've gone from a historically terrible generation to a really good generation, like maybe mm-hmm. 11th gen Intel to 12th gen Intel. Mm-hmm. Aside from which those you situations, have to upgrade anyway. which I, yeah, I, I know, but I guess my point <laughs> I know what is you're that saying, yeah, yeah. you go from something ba- really bad yep. and not very fast to something that's much faster. That's yep. the only time it makes sense, but. Mm. Even throughout most of the Ryzen generation, it didn't really make a lot of sense to do those single generation upgrades. No, that's right. And that's why the that's why we thought that the AM4 platform, the broad support, the longevity of that platform would be a key selling point. Because as Tim said, you don't really go the next generation. The generation after that, maybe, that's where it starts to possibly yeah. make sense. And I think with AM4, it did. Especially, especially if you jump up a tier. Like yeah, you're going, going up- Ryzen 5 to- Two generations future mm-hmm. Ryzen 7. It's a big Absolutely. upgrade. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. From like the Ryzen 5 1600 to the Ryzen 7 3700X. That was a huge performance upgrade um, depending yep. on if you needed that performance. And then certainly the generation after that, it made sense. So, yep. yeah. I think that answers that one. During AMD's Computex keynote, Lisa Su said that while AM4 is a great platform that will continue for many years to come, Uh, Do you think this is AM4 being confirmed as not being dead after all? Perhaps as the budget lineup to replace A630. Um, I don't really know what the takeaway should be from those comments. For me, it was basically we have this really robust five-year platform that now is basically you can go, you can mix and match CPUs and motherboards pretty freely, really, for for most, uh, I think, MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS, for sure, you can put like 5,000 series Ryzen processors on a 300 series board. That's pretty incredible. I, I think, well, for me, I took those comments to mean more, we will continue to support that platform in the form of like a GSA microcode update. So yeah. if there's security issues or ongoing USB issues, we will continue to address those and roll out updates and they'll be supported platforms. So they won't be neglected or discontinued or end of life or however you want to put it. Yeah, exactly. And on top of that, I would expect that you'd be able to continue buying AM4 motherboards. Yes. Because they just launched the 5800X3D. So how bizarre would it be to launch the 5800X3D and then within six months be like, yeah, so we're not going to be releasing any more BIOS updates and you won't be able to buy those boards mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. That would be very, very strange. Yeah, the CPUs as well probably remain on sale for a while. Yeah, exactly. So... <laughs> You know, I think probably our expectation would be that, for example, 
I think it's unlikely that we'll initially get an AM5 CPU for, let's say, 150 US dollars. Mm-hmm. It would make a lot of sense that AM4 is still available for people in that yeah, category. Ryzen 5 5600 would, would be that part, I would say. Yep. Uh, whether we get... I, I, look, I don't expect we'll get new processors uh, on that socket. Maybe like rebranded or refreshed could be some sort of possibility yeah. depending on how the low end goes. But yeah, not expecting new chipsets or CPUs, but yep. we'll see what happens there. All right, Steve and Tim, do you think it is necessary for AMD to increase core counts for Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5 to compete with the new Core i7 and Core i5? Uh, assuming Intel doubles the e-cores in both of those products. So this is like Raptor Lake versus Zen 4, I suppose. Yep. So I think what the expectation with Raptor Lake is that the P-core count is going to stay the same and mm-hmm. the E-core count will be doubled. So mm-hmm. something like the thir- 13900K, is that really what it's going to oh, be? Please. That's the first time I've ever said that yeah. out loud and it sounds bad. It's very the, awkward. The 13900K mm. would have eight P-cores and 16 E-cores theoretically. Mm-hmm. So, I mean- That would be a productivity beast. Yeah, I mean, you've shown in the past that e-cores have limited usefulness for gaming. Mm-hmm. So the main gains will be for things like rendering and those mm-hmm. sorts of things, compilations, etc., for yep. productivity stuff. So if Intel aren't getting much of an IPC game with Raptor Lake, but they're adding a lot more cores, that could be countered by AMD getting a significant frequency and IPC gain for Zen 4. So They've already shown in Blender, for example, their 16-core CPU sample versus the 12900K was 46% faster Mm -hmm. for rendering a Blender workload. So you'd think that taking a 12900K and adding another eight E-cores, would that even give you 46% uplift? Probably not. Probably not. You never know. Well, you never know. The performance could be improved in other areas, Exactly, exactly. But... I, I don't think it's a given that they need to increase core count. It really does depend what the next generation looks like for their performance. Because, mm-hmm. again, Zen 4 is going to have every core with the same level of performance because mm-hmm. they're not using a hybrid approach and Intel adding more e-cores. You know, the balance there could depend. So, yeah. I mean, I guess one thing that you know could impact is if they take a product like a 12400, which has no e-cores, mm-hmm. and they start adding in e-cores, that could produce quite a big productivity gain. Yeah, again, on how many it, they is, add in. it is productivity we'll be talking about there, not, yeah. not gaming. So, I mean, it, they're not useless for gaming, but they're not particularly useful either. No, I mean, so, they... Well, and it could change in the future. Yeah, I mean, Intel sort of said they are they help with background tasks and maybe future games will start mm-hmm. using them, but we haven't really seen too much of that impact yet. Yeah, it's uh, with current games, you don't want to use them in really any capacity for gaming, if you can help it. Yeah. If it can lighten the load on the background tasks, then sure, there's probably a benefit there. All right. With AMD only offering DDR5 support and AM5, do you think this will put them at a price disadvantage to Intel with DDR4 slash DDR5? Um, so, well, we expect that Zen 4 will launch with mostly the high-end parts initially because of the DDR5 pricing and availability, which it, it, it's slowly coming down and improving, but I don't think it'll be enough where you would want to pair it with the $200 part. It's not going to be DDR4 pricing. No. I think you can get I th- I think you can get like maybe 32 gig DDR5 kits for minimum like around $200, which is still About double twice the price, yeah. Still double slightly less than double the price of DDR4, mm-hmm. but obviously this will have an impact on pricing mm-hmm. of, you know, the whole AM5 platform. But yeah, as you say, launching the high-end parts first kind of mitigates that to some degree. <laughs> Yeah, and I hate to harp on about this, but for me, this is somewhat irrelevant and a non-issue. The, the, the key thing, is if AMD comes out and says, we will be supporting officially this socket for the next four years or the next three or four generations, then I think that would, for a lot of people, make it worth going for DDR5 now, spending the bit of extra money and getting a decent motherboard, knowing that you know three generations later, they can very likely get substantially more CPU performance with a drop-in option. Mm. So, of course, with Old Lake, if you go DDR4 because it's cheaper and that's sort of your competitor point. Not only do you sort of motherboard useless. Yeah. Memory's um, going to be useless soon. Memory's going to be so. useless. So, yeah, I, I think that would warrant paying a bit of a premium now because at least you know that memory. And look, 
you know, the memory may not be the greatest memory three years down the track. And you can make that argument with DDR4 uh, because like first gen Ryzen didn't have yep. great DDR4 memory support. But still, if you use that same memory today with even a 5800X 3D or uh, Ryzen 5 5600, you're not getting the most optimal performance, but it's very near. It's not yeah. like it's, you know, half the performance. You're getting very close to what, you know, you, you see in reviews. So, yeah, for me, really the AM5 commitment there is what I want to see more than anything. Yep. Thoughts on PCIe Gen 5 being just around the corner, even though Gen 4 hasn't even settled as the dominant PCIe. Will we see AIB shift completely towards Gen 5 and or end production of Gen 3? So Gen 5 is not around the corner. It, 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 it's, came, it's it, came, it came around the corner months ago. Uh, so it's definitely here, but it, yeah, more at the high end. And, and even then we asked, just, there is limited products, but you know, there are PCIe 5.0 SSDs, for example, the performance on those is insane. And, you know, next gen graphics cards will support that interface potentially later this year. Yep. And then Zen 4, uh, AMD's next platform will have PCIe 5.0. So that's around the corner. Um, but PCIe 3.0, 4.0, they'll, they'll all sort of coexist. I think you'll start to see the PCI Express revision become a feature. So the latest and greatest platforms will support whatever the latest and greatest PCIe revision is. Then 4.0 4 was probably reserved for just a, a tier under to sort of the mid range. And then I don't know if we'll see any entry level stuff using PCI, like, you know, APUs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think PCI 3.0 for new products, even the entry level stuff is possible, probably. I guess but it depends because, like, there's so many lanes out of chipsets these days that they might have, mm -hmm. like, a couple of mm -hmm. M.2 lanes as PCI 3.0 sure. or something. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if depends. we'll see new. Certainly, we won't see graphics cards going forward using it because that's not no, how that that's, works. That's uh, I'm not even sure we would see new CPUs using it. But anyway, it, it, I think the best way to, to answer it is we, we you'll see different tiers of products using that as a, it'll be a feature of what level of uh, you know PCI Express you get, and certainly four and five will will coexist. Yeah, and I think this has come about simply because, you know, there's a lot of this talk about, oh, Gen 5 seems like it's just here after Gen 4. Mm -hmm. I think it's mostly because Gen 4 took so long to come out after PCI 3.0, mm -hmm. but PCI 3.0 was reasonably quick after 2.0, and mm -hmm. 2.0 was reasonably quick after 1.0. So I think we're back to a more normal cadence of PCIe, and I would expect that – I know the PCI 6.0 specification has been – Mm -hmm. announced and is in the process of being sort of finalized so we're probably going to see that in maybe three to four years is mm -hmm. sort of another thing so yeah i guess the only real issue with these this sort of gen 5 versus gen 4 is if we see more 6500 xt like products mm -hmm. but instead shifting to like pci 5.0 yep. times 4 mm -hmm. as a requirement to get the maximum performance out of those gpus that will restrict those cards to being useful in the yeah, latest and greatest systems. <laughs> they'll become very messy. But provided that most companies are using at least a times eight, but ideally a times sixteen slot, then mm -hmm. they're gonna be the fact that the technology okay. is fully backwards compatible yeah. means that it's somewhat of a non issue. Yeah, it's really only those, those times four products for GPUs that mm -hmm. may have issues depending on how far back you go. Yep. But yeah, it shouldn't be an issue. All right, this is one of the core classic cores type questions without necessarily being that well i suppose it is looking at the cpu advances of the last four years and the possible leaps to come in the future if someone has a modern eight core amd or six core elder lake cpu uh, will there even be a need to upgrade the cpu in the next four to five years so really i mean this can just be six core cpus in general as far as i'm concerned like the ryzen 5 5600 but certainly yep. elder lake which is faster again Look, for the next four to five years, is uh, that's quite a, a time frame to predict. But I'm going to be – it's it's a it's a tough one to answer because if you're paying serious Halo-type money, like yep. premium money, so think like Broadwell E-type money for a six-core CPU, therefore you are expecting Halo flagship performance, a no-compromise gaming solution. Yep. A single stutter is a deal-breaker. You're buying it to be the fastest thing, right? Yeah. Yep. So in that sense, 
absolutely not going to last four to five years because two years time, there'll be something that is certainly much faster and you are the kind of person that would want that product. Yep. So why are you buying a six core processor today? Why are you buying a, a 12400 or a Ryzen 5 5600? Buy it because it's a good value part today and it represents good value gaming. It's certainly powerful enough to play all current games without any issues. That's even true when paired with a high-end GPU. So you're buying it as a good value part. So will it still be able to play games in four years' time and you know have been a good value part? I would say yes. Again, four years is quite some time out, and we are expecting to have a lot of changes, but the gaming industry moves slow. Yes. So, and I think as well for productivity, this is very easily answered that you would want to upgrade if mm -hmm. time is money sort of thing. But you wouldn't be buying a six core or even yeah. an eight you wouldn't even be buying an eight core so yeah, you buy the, the flagship stuff. Yep. I think for games and I I can't remember why I was recently talking about this, whether it was on a live stream or whether it was on like the Moore's Law is Dead podcast or one of those places. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to games and game development, we've seen over the last however many years, maybe even a decade, that game developers haven't really utilized too many of the CPU resources. And I think it comes down to, well, firstly, the previous consoles, so previous to the PlayStation 5 era, the CPUs were very, very slow, mm -hmm. very slow. And they're, they're now Zen 2 era. They're very slow is, compared to a Ryzen 5 5600. Yeah, so they're, they're slow now mm -hmm. as well compared to the fastest parts, but they're certainly... The the previous CPUs were, were so much slower compared to the current stuff sure. is what I'm saying. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, for PC hardware, CPU development was stagnating massively. Mm -hmm. So... During the time that a lot of the game engines that we currently see today being used significantly, like Unreal Engine 4 as one example, was being a lot of work was being put into the development during Intel's period of stagnation. Mm -hmm. So if you're a game engine developer and you're seeing Intel come out with, you know, 5% gains year on year, why would you bother making CPU features that would use would re require eight cores? Yeah, or high -end desktop CPU. Significantly faster. Thousand dollar CPU. Because you're looking at what's happening in the market and you're like, well, that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what you'd design your engine around would be the hardware of the time and sort of a look into the future for the next few years. Mm -hmm. Whereas over the last five years, I think what we've seen is, well, there's been simply a lot more performance being put into these CPUs. So as game developers are creating the next generation of game engines, mm -hmm. I mean, true next generation engines like Unreal Engine 5 yep. as an example, ones that are designed for from the ground up or at least significantly overhauled for like PlayStation 5 architecture, Xbox mm -hmm. Series X architecture, you know, game developers now can see that CPU performance is increasing much more substantially. And I think as these game engines start being rolled out, there is the potential that we'll see games start utilizing CPUs more because they're not sitting around saying, oh, well, you know, if I put in this major, like let's say they want to significantly increase the NPC count mm -hmm. in their engines, mm -hmm. Previously, they were like, well, that's not going to run on any hardware. It's not yep. going to run on my quad-core CPU, and mm -hmm. we're not expecting anything better than a quad-core anytime soon, which today they can make more forward-looking engines that can scale better because they know that those that hardware will exist in the future. Yeah, the people that... I think one of the big mistakes, the people who talk about six cores, like a Ryzen 5 5600X being no good for gaming in the future... They're, they're, they're misinterpreting or they're just ignoring what we've seen. And everything you've said is true, but there's, a, there's an extended lag added to that. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. it, it's sort of the lowest common denominator type thing, the weakest link in the chain. Yet we have to get to a point in time where the 5600X, that level of performance, so forget core counts, that level of CPU processing power is sort of the minimum. That's what yeah. everyone has. And then you build from that. So, yep. and then really for that to be discontinued, useless, obsolete, the 5800X level of processing power has to be the bare minimum. Yep. And then you go on from that. And again, there's, as I, as I alluded to earlier, there's sort of two separate conversations where are you expecting halo performance? Are you expecting yep. just mid-range, it works performance? So again, everything you've just said is true, Unreal 5 engine, but... That doesn't mean all Unreal 5 engine games will require a 5800X. No. It just means that that engine has the ability to scale to the point where it would. Yeah, th that's what I'm hoping we see more of mm -hmm. with fast CPUs is not that we see games that completely choke up a 5600X, mm -hmm. but hopefully game developers are putting in features where 
you know, previously the difference between a slow and like at least what I would class like a minimum tier CPU and the mm-hmm. absolute fastest CPU, I think previously was a lot lower than yeah. it is today. Mm-hmm. Like there are people today using, I don't know, like, like your Ryzen 5 1600 example from earlier, compared to a 5950X, the gap is like absolutely enormous yeah. in terms of, of the processing power difference in a consumer platform. Mm-hmm. Like you can run both of those CPUs on the same motherboard. So I th- I'm hoping that these next generation engines have a nice baseline that will run on reasonable hardware, but mm-hmm. gives people that are buying those flagship products a reason to have bought that product. Like, for example, turning up the NPCs massively, or maybe there's other advanced simulation features that you could run on a CPU. That's what I'm hoping that we see mm-hmm. and what what people will benefit from. But like like we're sort of talking about, the la- there's a lag. We're not there yet. We've had you know, quite powerful gaming CPUs for no- a number of years yet, and these engines are only just starting to be used in games. Yeah, so I guess with the four to five year example, that's when we sort of start expecting yeah. that to become a yeah. thing. Okay. All right, this is a bit of an interesting one. Uh, I don't know who will go first here. <laughs> what manufacturer, in your opinion, has the best products across their whole lineup? This includes monitors, motherboards, mice, etc. So peripherals, core PC hardware, monitors... I would say my guess would probably start with an A. An A? And a, a, and be sus. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't know. It's such a hard question. It, it's one of those questions where I really don't want to say it depends, but also... No, but you have, it, 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 it doesn't depend, though, because we know they've all got good and bad products. But who... If if because you, you kind of have to pick unanimously which one has... If you had to say, all right, I've, I'm, I'm building a fanboy themed PC. It's all like the tough gaming so, one we just built. It has to, you have to have all of the components. So yep. from the one brand, so you have to have like, you know, an Asus MSI or gigabyte case, power supply, storage. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm wondering is, I get all that. I guess what I'm thinking is like, are we talking over the entire history of the company? Right or now. are we talking right no, now? right now. Because I think like every company has had problematic products over the journey. But not all of them. Like there's the gigabyte power supply thing, but it doesn't necessarily cover all of the models. And like Asus had the problem with the Strix 5700, but they did have other good products at the same time. Yeah. So if you could pick and choose the good product, like they may have, a, well, they've all got crappy cases, but they have a decent case. So you'd pick that case. And then monitors, they've they've all got less than- I think if you were- I, th- I definitely think if you're choosing high-end flagship stuff that you would go with Asus. Mm-hmm. I think they tend to make the best high-end products. but I think- At least consistently across everything. Yeah, I think for, for more mid-range stuff, especially for monitors, I don't think they've typically had the most compelling mid-range mm-hmm. uh, or entry-level sort of budget bank. For Same with their motherboards. Their budget motherboards aren't typically very good. So then would I go with MSI or Gigabyte for that? And- uh, I think it, MSI. It's hard because, yeah, I think well, MSI has some products that Gigabyte doesn't, don't yes. they? Like they, Gigabyte does not produce cases as far as I'm aware. Uh, they, they do they, storage? No, Gigabyte has definitely done cases before. Whether they still are, they, yeah. they have at one point in time, I'm not sure. Uh, storage, they definitely have an Aorus brand SSD and stuff like that. I think yeah. most of them have you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, I think... Gigabyte's en- entry level bank for buck monitors, I think, are better than MSI's monitors in the same price category, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are plenty of good MSI monitors that I've recommended, but I think if we're talking the low value sort of, the, the best value to- sort of products, I'd have Gigabyte there. But then I think the rest of the lineup, you probably would swing it to MSI. Like, but- well, graphics cards, much of a muchness, really. The motherboards, yeah. there. I mean, MSI generally does a little bit better, at least recently, but. You know, Gigabyte mm. has good options as well. What about peripherals? Like mice, keyboards, MSI makes those, don't they? Gigabyte, do they make? Yeah, I think... It's not something I look at too much, if MS- I'm perfectly I th- honest. I think MSI stuff's a bit more modern up to date, but I, I, I'm i not 100% sure on that. Uh, they're, they're, neither of them are Logitech, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right, that is going to do it for the May Q&A part one, part two done. There will be no part three. Tim didn't pick enough questions. So I'll cop the blame on this one. That's fine. <laughs> I guess that's how that's working now. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, no part three for those of you who enjoy it. Um, maybe next month. We'll see if Tim can do a better job next month. Mm-hmm. 
So mm-hmm. all, all the hate towards Tim in the comment section, please. Uh, but no, a lot of fun. Good job picking the questions. A lot of interesting ones there, Tim. So I'll, I'll give that to you. It was good. Cool. And well, of course, yeah. all the viewers who asked those great questions. Bit of mixed feedback, but whatever. I'll take it, I like, guess. I don't, I don't know where to go with this. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but no, that's it. So we have uh, Float Plane, Patreon. You mm-hmm. can sign up to yep. either of those if you want more. Behind the scenes content, actually, now would be a great time to sign up, wouldn't it? Because we are building Tim a new studio and we're going to start filming that the next week. In a couple of days, yeah. Yeah, a couple of days from now. So that should be cool. A lot of behind the scenes content for that. Not sure if any of it will make it to the main channel, but if it does, it'll be months away from now. So yeah, if you want that access of Tim's new studio getting built and all the shenanigans that will no doubt happen during that, well, check out our Patreon Float Plan account. You'll also get access to our exclusive Discord server. Um, Q&A stuff, live streams. Yep. A lot of cool stuff. So yeah, anyway, check it out. But if not, perfectly fine. And as always, just thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. See you next time. <laughs>